Tom not to hear. All I know, I keep forgetting. <laughs> I mainly today want to read you something. I, I saw some brothers on the way in. We have to read this whole book before we do. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but I would like to turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter number two. I'm just going to try to follow the Lord because uh, I don't trust me. Um, whenever I've decided, oh, Lord, I don't know that much about that subject, and I'd rather not talk about I'd rather talk about something else. And then when I talked about that something else that I've chosen, uh, it's really bad. Really bad. You may think when it's good, it's bad. But, <laughs> but it's really bad when I do, when I don't go ahead and stick my neck out into areas that uh, maybe I don't even seem to belong in. Um, um, I'd like to look at the first uh, few verses here, but before we do that, remembering that the chapter number one uh, a book of Hebrews, and this book was written to obviously to Jewish Christians. And uh, well, most Christians at this time were Jewish. Hello. On the day of Pentecost, it says, now there were Jews out of every country dwelling in Jerusalem. Jews. And when the Holy Ghost was poured out, and the last days began on that time. As you know, Jesus fulfilled the law in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It tells us about Jesus under the law, made of a woman under the law, he said, I didn't come to destroy the law or the prophets, but I came to fulfill. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until he said, it is finished, that he fulfilled mm -hmm. everything of the old <coughs> and set in motion the new. It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his human spirit. He gave up the ghost. For in order for us to die, our spirit has to leave our body. As the body without the spirit is dead, it says. So faith without works is dead. The body without the spirit. I am a spirit. I live in this body. I have a soul. And my soul is made up of my mind and my emotions, the seat of my thoughts and emotions. As a human being, I can't divide between the soul and, and the spirit, for they are so intermeshed, but God can divide. The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword and can divide asunder the soul and the spirit. He can divide that up. If I want to contact the physical world, I reach out with my physical body and contact it. If I want to contact the emotional world the, or the world of the intellect, that's the world of the soul, Maybe I can play some soul music. And I'll feel that soul music. Uh, so, um, 
Stevie Wonder was talked about last night, and uh, Joshua played a little Stevie Wonder for us. And that was pretty impressive, of course. Hallelujah. But I contact the realm of the soul and the mind, uh, maybe by some music or book. But if I want to contact God, I have to contact Him through the Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hello. God is Spirit. Now I know King James Version says in John 4, 24, God is a Spirit. But that was corrected by the translators later on. And they all translated God is Spirit. A Spirit can be over in the corner of a room someplace. But God is Spirit. He is everywhere present, all at the same time. Omnipresent. Amen? Amen. I mean, how long does it take him to get to Japan? <coughs> how long does it take to get to Berlin? How long does it take, hallelujah, to get to the farthest star, the farthest galaxy? Hallelujah. He's already there. Amen? Amen. So you can't put him in a box with a fox. <laughs> Amen? You can't put him in a box. Jesus said, you've neither seen his shape nor heard his voice. No man hath seen God at any time. For he dwells in a light unto which no man can approach. Then what have we seen? We see the manifestations of God in creation as Father. When he became flesh, we see him as the only begotten, begotten son. The only son that was genetically formed in the flesh from God. Then when he went away, he said, I am with you now, but I shall be in you. How is he in us? If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. But when we receive the Holy Ghost, or Holy Spirit, His Spirit bears witness with our spirit, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. His Spirit bears witness with our spirit. And now we are called the sons of God. Begotten, not sons of God in the flesh, but begotten of the Spirit. Yes. I am a Spirit. And I am in the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is in me. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We can go into the presence of God. We did it, and we're doing it. We did it today. Yes. Why do you think we take the time to do this? Because as priests of God, the job of the priest is to bring God and man together. Yes. Yes. This is what yes. priesthood is all about. Yes. We have the anointing of Melchizedek upon us. The anointing of Melchizedek, he is a king, he has the priest, and he is, by the way, the prophet, the apostle of our faith, the high priest, he is all in all. But we are anointed to be kings and priests unto our God and Father. Hallelujah. And we look for the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The great God. It is right to call him God. In Hebrews chapter 1, he is called God. He is shown to be superior to angels. We know that he's not an angel because the Bible said God commanded all the angels to worship him. And in the book of Revelation, 
John bowed down to worship an angel and he said, No, see thou do it not. Worship God. I am your fellow servant. For are not the angels all made ministering spirits to minister for them that shall be heirs of eternal life? It was an evil spirit that fell from the place of throne that he had in the kingdom of God. He fell from a throne. But he said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, above the angels of God. I will be like the Most High. But he was cast down. He was in Eden, the garden of God. And his beauty was excellent. And his wisdom was excellent. But he was lifted up in his heart. And so God cast him out of the mountain of God. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. In the city of our God. In the mountain of His holiness. Beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. The church. In the sides of the north. He said, I will set upon the mount of the congregation. Satan said, in the sides of the north. Beautiful for situation. The joy of the Holy Spirit is Mount Zion. It sets in the sides of the north, the city of the great king. He wanted that city. But he was cast out of the mountain of God. Jesus said, I give you power to cast out demons. I give you power over scorpions. Amen? Yes. Serpents. And over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall be any means hurt you. The wicked one toucheth us not. Hallelujah. Quit giving him too much credit. Amen. The wicked one toucheth us not. Hallelujah. Greater is he that is in us than he that is the Antichrist that is in the world. The spirit of Antichrist is working in the world. Evil spirits are working in the world. How much more the angels of God who are ministering spirits ministering unto us who shall be the heirs of eternal life, which we have already by faith, if we continue in the faith, rooted and grounded and steadfast, built up on the most holy faith, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might not an option. It's a commandment. Be strong in the Lord, in the power of His might. Hallelujah. First chapter of Hebrews tells us that God is greater than angels. As we go to the book of Hebrews, it says that Jesus is greater not only than angels, but He's greater than Moses. This was a blow to the Jewish Christians. Greater than Moses. We've been serving the law that Moses gave for 1,400 years. And you're saying that this Jesus, who was crucified outside of Jerusalem, is greater than Moses? But greater than Moses is here. Greater than Aaron, the high priest of our profession. Greater than Aaron. Greater than the temple in Jerusalem. The church is now the temple. It is invisible. You can't see it. They could go to their temple. They could watch the ceremony. In this temple, we enter into his presence with singing. We come into his courts with praise. Hallelujah. But it's invisible to the naked eye. It's invisible to the carnal man. But Abraham looked for a city which hath foundations. We are now sitting in that city. We right now are sitting in the city that Abraham was looking for. He wandered 
around in the desert. And he kept looking for the city that has foundations. The apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. We are called the Neon of God. Not the Heron of God. Hallelujah. I used to have a brother-in-law, I still have a brother-in-law, Rudy Strauss. And, and he did he had hair when he was younger, but his brother Campbell called him Herr Rudolph. <laughs> and every time we talk about the Heron Temple, I keep thinking about that. Heron Temple. And my dad always used to claim, when I came here, I didn't need a haircut. I said, well, Rudy came here, he, didn't, didn't, he had hair. Anyway. I'll go back. Neon! <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Neon! Not Heron! Neon! I'm thinking of a pun. I, I'm not, I'm going to resist it. <laughs> I'm thinking of the Karate Kid right now. Anyway. Forgive me. Hallelujah. Neon. The temple is the neon of God. People are looking for Antichrist, the Antichrist. They call him the Antichrist, which is a misnomer, but they call him the Antichrist. And they're looking for the Antichrist to appear in Jerusalem in a temple made with hands. But they forgot to read a little more closely in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, but it says that he sets in the neon of God. Not the Heron, but the neon. And Jesus said, and the apostles said, you are the neon of God. You are the holiest of holies. You are the temple of God. The man of sin will appear in the church. In the apostate church. The Lord is talking to us here in the book of Hebrews chapter 2. Because all these angels are ministering to us, therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we let them slip. Everybody say slip. Slip. Don't let them slip. If you notice the Greek in the margin of your Bible, it says run out as leaking vessels. We ought to give them more earnest heed, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing the witness? both with signs and wonders and with divers or various miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. I want to read you something in conclusion. If I can find it quickly enough. Look up he rules. These are Barnes notes on the New Testament. Stay with me. Should have been a Today is the day of salvation. Amen. Today is the day to be baptized in Jesus' name. Amen. Not tomorrow. Amen. Most of the day, we see the Holy Ghost on one Sunday, speaking in other tongues. In the coffee hour. And Thursday she came to a Bible class and she realized the urgency of baptism. 
The early New Testament church did not give eight weeks of catechism before baptism. Why? Because it's for the remission of sins. Some say, well, we don't believe in baptismal regeneration. Well, maybe, maybe not. All I can tell you is what the scripture says. I can't tell you about baptismal regeneration. I can only tell you that it says in the New Testament, Act 2.38, when Peter was asked, what must we do? Must we do because we crucified Christ? Our sins crucified Christ. What must we do? He said, repent, change your thinking. And be baptized. Every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ. <coughs> For the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And this promises to everyone, as many as the Lord our God shall call. But if baptism has something to do with remission, remission means the sending away of our sins. Our sins have been piling up. And they hurt us. And I talked about the moat. God wants to put a barrier between you and the devil where he cannot get at you. If you're possessed of the devil, if you'll be filled with the Holy Ghost, you're no longer possessed of the devil. Hallelujah, but you're filled with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. If your sins are remitted, you no longer have your sins. If they are not remitted, you have them. Whosoever sins you remit, they shall be remitted. How do they get remitted? Repent to be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. How are they retained? People refuse to go to the bank and collect what belongs to them. So the bank retains it. Even though it belongs to them. Well, if there's any question about it, Ethiopian eunuch riding in the desert, and he says to Philip after his first sermon, first Bible study, here's water, what does it hinder me from being baptized? What were they talking about? They must have been talking about baptism. Here's water. Stopped the chariot. Got out, went down into the water, baptized him. The people of Samaria, when they believed Philip preaching the word of God, they were baptized, both men and women. The apostles came down to pray for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. The Apostle Paul asked the disciples in 19th chapter, book of Acts, 20 years later, after the day of Pentecost, he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? They said, we don't know about the Holy Ghost. Well, then how were you baptized? Under John's baptism. They were re-baptized immediately in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul, who was persecuting the church, I don't know about regeneration, no baptism. I only know what the Word says. And I can only tell you what the Word says. Somebody asked me one time in the hospital, should I have this operation or should I not have this operation? I said, that's not for me to decide. My, my job is to tell you what the Word of God says. Period. Not to make a judgment or judge you. But when Paul, knocked down by the light on the road to Damascus, knocked down by the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, Lord, who are you? He said, I'm Jesus. What? Whom thou persecutest. Oh, my goodness. What 
would you have me to do? Go into Damascus. Hmm. Syria. Go into Damascus, and it shall be told you what to do. Ananias, a disciple, was praying, and the Lord spoke to him and said, Don't be afraid, for now Paul prayeth. He went religion classes before, but now he's actually praying. <laughs> Hallelujah. But you know he wasn't praying to make a contact with God. He's going out and killing Christians. Putting them to death. Arresting them. Putting them in prison. Ananias walks in. And there's Paul. He's blind. He hasn't eaten for three days. Three nights he hasn't drunk a drop of water for three days and three nights. Ananias walks in and says, Brother Saul. Brother Saul. Arise. And be baptized. And wash away your sins. Calling on the name of the Lord. I don't know about baptism or regeneration, but I do know the word says, be baptized for the remission of sins, and I know it says, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. God wants to put a barrier between you and the devil. God wants to put a barrier between you and your sins. He wants to put a moat that the devil can't cross to get in your hummingbird feeder. <laughs> Hallelujah! So your hummingbird feeder won't be contaminated with insects. Hello? This is a parable. Alright. We should let them sweat. Another translation. Lest we let them flow out of our minds. Lest at any time we should give, should slight them. These are different translations. That they may not entirely slip out of our memories. The word here used occurs nowhere else in the New Testament. The Septuagint translators, a Bible translated 200 years before Christ, into Greek, have used the word but once, Proverbs 3. 21. Son, do not pass by, but keep my counsel. That is, do not pass by my advice by neglect. Hello. Some people are neglecting yeah. or suffer it to be disregarded. The word means, according to Passau, to flow by, to flow over, and then to go by, to flow, to fall, to flow away. After all that has been said on the meaning of the word here, it seems to me that the true sense of the expression is the flowing or gliding by as a river. We let things sit, yeah. and that the meaning here is that we should be very cautious that the important truths spoken by the Redeemer and the Apostles should not be suffered to glide by us without attention or without profit. We should not allow them to be like a stream that glides on by us without benefiting us. That is, we should endeavor to secure and retain them as our own. It talks about great danger, that it will not profit us, but that we will lose all the benefit of it. This danger may arise from not feeling that the truths revealed are important. And before their importance is felt, they may be beyond our reach. So when we are often deceived in regard to the importance of objects, and before we perceive their value, they are irrevocably gone. So it is often with time. Hello. Letting the thing of the Lord slip. Well, I'll do it later. So, it is often with time and with the opportunities of obtaining an education 
or of accomplishing any object which is of value. The opportunity is gone before we perceive its importance. So the young suffer the most important period of life to glide away before they perceive its value. Oh, hallelujah. The Lord wants to speak to someone yes. here today. Yes. And the opportunity of making much of their talents is lost because they did not embrace the suitable opportunities. Number two, by being engrossed in business, we feel that it is now the most important thing, business, that claims our attention. That claims our attention. We have no time to pray, to read the Bible, to think of religion. For the cares of the world engross all the time and the opportunities of salvation glide insensibly away until it is too late. I tell you, you've made a wise decision to come to church, but to go to church and meet with the saints of the Most High Amen. on this day. Amen. I celebrate Yom Kippur today. Amen. I celebrated it yesterday. I will celebrate it tomorrow if I make it to tomorrow. But I know I'm slipping in between the two worlds. Hallelujah. I tell you, I love this place. I love the trees. I love the birds. I love to watch the leaves fall. Hallelujah. I love and treasure the present eternal moment. Hallelujah. But I may slip to the other side. I almost did. Recently. Very recently. Hallelujah. It will be okay. But opportunity, by being attracted by the pleasures of life, we attend to them now and are drawn along from one to another until religion is suffered to fly away with all its hopes and consolation. And we perceive too late that we have let the opportunity of salvation slip forever. Allured by those pleasures, the young neglected, and new pleasures starting up in future life carry on the delusion until every favorable opportunity for salvation has passed away. I chose to read this to you because who could say it better? Yeah. Ever Barnes. Written in 1850. We suffer favorable opportunities to pass without improving them. Youth is by far the best time, as it is the most appropriate time to become a Christian. And yet how easy it is to allow that period to slip away without becoming interested in the Savior. <coughs> One day glides on after another. One week, one month, one year passes away after another like a gently flowing stream until all the precious time of youth has gone. And we are not Christians. So we, so a revival of religion is a favorable time and yet many suffer this to pass by without becoming in it. Others are converted and the heavenly influences descend all around us, but we are unaffected. And the season so full of happy and heavenly influences is gone to return no more. We let the favorable season slip because we design to attend to it at some future period of life. So youth defers it to manhood, manhood to old age, and old age to deathbed, and then neglects it until the whole of life has glided away and the soul is not saved. Paul knew him. Paul knew man. He knew how prone 
uh, he was to let things of religion slip out of the mind. And hence, the earnestness of his caution that we should give heed to the subject now, lest the opportunity of salvation should soon glide away. When once passed, it can never be recalled. Learn hence, number one, the truths of religion will not benefit us unless we give heed to them. Amen? Amen. It will not save us that the Lord has come and spoken to men unless we are disposed to listen. It will not benefit us that the sun shines unless we open our eyes. Books will not benefit us unless we read them. Medicine unless we take it. Nor will the fruits of the earth sustain our lives, however rich and abundant they may be, if we disregard and neglect them. Yes. So with the truths of religion. There is truth enough to save the world, but the world disregards and despises it. It needs not great sins to destroy the soul. Simple neglect will do it as certainly as atrocious crime. Every man has a sinful heart that will destroy him unless he makes an effort to be saved. And it is not merely the great sinner, therefore, who is in danger. It is the man who neglects his soul, whether a moral or an immoral man, a daughter of amiableness or a daughter of vanity and how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? The Lord put this in my heart a number of days ago. To warn me, any, all of us, we better not let these things slip. While it is called to be, pardon not your heart. Hard and not your heart. I'm not deep. I want to add something to Brother David said the Lord had spoken to his heart because we were talking about saying to people, Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? It's a good question. Because if you don't know Jesus, you can go to church for a whole lifetime and not know Jesus. Hallelujah. I'd like to add something to that. Do we have the courage to take it a step farther? Would you like to receive Jesus right now? See, all his best stuff is work. No, I am with you. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth in his baptized shall be saved. Hallelujah. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them. Teaching them. Do you know for certain that you have eternal life? If you come to the place in your spiritual life that you know for certain that you have each one. So I've asked somebody right where they're standing. 
you would like to receive eternal life right now as a free gift. Because receiving Jesus, in order to receive eternal life, you must receive Jesus. So he is the way, the truth, and the life. That's all. To receive Jesus, this is repentance. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Will you trust Him right now? Would you bow your head with me? Is it okay if I lay my hand on you? Would you pray this prayer? Lord Jesus, I come to you right now. I know that I have sinned. I know that I have fallen. I come short of the glory. I confess my sins. I ask you to forgive me for my sins. Right now. And I receive it by faith. Now, Lord, I ask you to come into my heart. For you are my Savior. You are my God. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to ask you a question. Were you sincere when you prayed the prayer? He said, Behold, I come. I knock on the door. Right? I stand at the door and knock. Did you come to the door? Then where is he? He's in your heart. By faith. Now we're ready. We're ready to be baptized. We're ready to receive. Oh, those power, power. Hallelujah. So, but just by praying that prayer. So, can we stop in a grocery store? Can we stop on the highway and say, "You know Jesus? Would you like to know Jesus right now? Would you like to receive Him right now? Would you like to receive Him from now, right now?" We need to go out as an army of the Lord into the world, into the highways, and the byways, and the hedges, and compel them before it's too late. Mm -hmm. yeah. Too late for them, <coughs> too late for us to fulfill why we came. Yes, you can. Maybe you should stand up and face it me. <laughs> Maybe you should. Okay, so, um, so Isaiah 58 says, um, true worship is all false worship. It says, shout, this is a new living translation. Um, shout with the voice of a trumpet blast. Shout aloud, don't be timid. Shout my people, Israel, of their sins. Yet they act so pious. They come to the temple every day and seem delighted to learn all about me. They act like a righteous nation that would never abandon the laws of its God. They ask me to take action on their behalf, pretending they want to be near me. We have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed? We have been very hard on ourselves, and you don't even notice it. I will tell you why, I respond. It's because you are fasting to please yourselves. Even while you fast, you keep oppressing your workers. What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarrels? This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. You humble yourselves by going through the motions of penance, bowing your head like Greeks and pretending the winds. You dress in burlap and cover yourselves in ashes. Is, is this what you call fasting? Do you really think this would please the Lord? No, this kind of fasting, this is the kind of fasting I want. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry and give shelter to the poor. <coughs> Give clothes to those who need them, and do not hide from relatives who need your help. Then your salvation will come like the dawn, and your wounds will quickly heal. Your godliness will lead you forward, and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Then you will call the Lord. Then when you call the Lord, you will answer. Yes, I am here, he will quickly reply. Remove the heavy yoke of oppression. 
stop pointing your finger and spreading precious rumors. Feed the hungry and help those in trouble. Then your light will shine forth.